Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to Book Trek 2023, the summer of Trek. This is a summer long event created by Vin at Revenant Reads. It's a variation on Book Trek that's existed for a couple of years, where we read Star Trek fiction all summer long. We are unbounded in terms of prompts or categories, we're, and we're broad open in terms of time all summer long. You read a Star Trek novel this summer, you've participated in Book Trek 2023, the summer of Trek. Now, I am doing a lot of Star Trek reading so far for the first month of Book Trek because I love Star Trek. Just absolutely love it. I've loved it from the beginning. I love the show. I love the fan fiction that was popping up when the first season of the show is still was still going on. I've watched, I've read all of the fanzines, all of the local stuff. I talked with people on the phone, the old telephones, to say, you know, do you have a fanzine? Do you know of one in your area that's really good? Could you maybe send me a copy? That sort of thing. We were hungry for Star Trek fiction. And those early fanzine Star Trek stories had a lot in common. They are unacceptable today. They would be unacceptable today. They couldn't be published today. The copyright owners for the Star Trek IP would shut them down immediately. Not just because they fiddled with canon, killed major characters, had major characters turn evil or whatnot, but also because uh, there was a strong element of uh, homoerotic sadomasochism when it came to Kirk and Spock. That seemed to be an irresistible urge. Star Trek fan fiction often went in that direction. And when Star Trek fiction started getting published by Bantam and Pocket and whatnot, and started becoming a real thing, an actual book that could make you money, then the studio more and more started paying attention to what was in those books, and that element of Star Trek fiction disappeared. Or it went underground. Maybe it still exists in fanfiction.net and whatnot, but it's certainly not in the books anymore. But for a long time there in the 70s, it was. It was everywhere. It was all over the fan fiction, and it crept into the books, specifically the books of Sandra Marshak and Marina Culbreth, <laughs> who are the authors of my favorite Star Trek novel, The Price of the Phoenix, which is about a giant vulcanoid alien, a super strong alien man named Omni, who has developed a, a scientific process, the Phoenix device, that combines aspects of the technology of the Star Trek transporter with aspects of the Star Trek technology of the replicator and new technology that records the mental emanations of a being that is in the extremis of immediate death in order to create an exact duplicate of that person. Not a clone, not an imperfect duplicate like the one we see in, in the Enemy Within in the original Star Trek, but a, the, an actual duplicate of that person. And uh, if you're canny and careful with using it, a regular transporter on the person that you have induced to think they are about to die, then you can have two identical copies of the same person. Because the process will have duplicated the person and produced an identical body with a transporter scan and a replicator. You, I guess, could do that. Uh, it's, it's wonky. The science is, is wonky and very interesting, I think. Even if these books had never been written, I would still have found those things interesting. What, what exactly is it? The Phoenix process essentially is if you're standing on the transporter platform and you say energize, and it, the transporter energizes, and that column of energy you know, superimposes itself on your body, then that energy effect goes away, and you're still standing on the transporter pad, but in your location, you have also appeared. So there's two of you now. Not half of one, but an exact duplicate of the other person. That's essentially what the Phoenix process is. And Omni knows, and our heroes, Jim Kirk, Mr. Spock, the female Romulan commander from the Enterprise incident, they all quickly realize how destabilizing this can be for the Federation. Go to a key diplomat. Does the key diplomat have a dead son? A dying wife? Is the diplomat himself capable of being duplicated? Go to the president of the Federation. Suddenly there are two. The, the amount of havoc that you could reach with such a device would be almost unlimited. And our heroes realize that. But they have a more personal stake in the matter because Omni has demonstrated the device on Jim Kirk. He orchestrates an, an incident where Kirk thinks that he is running into a burning building. He uses the, the device in Kirk's last moment of extremis before death to create a second Jim Kirk. But he also uses the transporter to save the original Kirk. So there are two of them. And they, so the second Kirk, eventually our heroes start calling him James, because he starts having different experiences, right? He's not 
he's walking around. He's seeing things that Jim Kirk is not seeing. So they start to become two different people almost immediately, built on an enormous foundation of being the same person. And Omni is the villain. He is the bad guy. He not only wants to sell this process to the highest bidder, destabilize the wall-to-wall -wall empires that are giving him the willies, but also to dominate Jim Kirk physically, almost sexually, to dominate him, physically beat him until he cries. It's an item that comes out of nowhere. <laughs> Actually, I shouldn't say that. It comes out of that old Star Trek fiction. Anyone who's read that old Star Trek fiction would recognize it in a heartbeat. <laughs> but Star Trek fans, especially ones that encounter it today, God only knows what they make of it. But uh, in the course of The Price of the Phoenix, our heroes have to deal with Omni, and they have to figure out a way to make a life for James. Uh, eventually it's decided that James will be surgically altered to pass as a Romulan and accompany the Romulan commander back into the Romulan Empire to live a life at her side. It'll have to be a protected life, because... Uh, Sondra Marashik and Myrna Kalbreth love to stress how strong Vulcans and therefore Romulans are, that they are much, much stronger than human beings. It, we, it was a vague thing at the time of the original Star Trek. It's not vague anymore. The, the difference between Vulcan strength and human strength is now quantified in canon. There's a great Deep Space Nine episode called Take Me Out to the Hollow Suite, where Benjamin Zisco recounts to, to Cassidy Yates his lifelong rivalry with a fellow captain, a fellow Starfleet cadet, a fellow captain, a, a Vulcan commander. And in the course of one of the stories that he tells Cassidy, Cisco mentions that he'd been drinking, he was really annoyed with this guy, and took a swing at him. And Cassidy's just, she's laughing her head off, she's stunned. She said, what, Vulcans are three times faster, than, three, they're three times stronger than human beings. You don't have a chance. And Cisco says, yeah, and boy, are they fast. <laughs> this is echoed in one moment on Star Trek Voyager, where an, a delusional Chakotay suddenly loses control of himself on the bridge, and is he thinks he's in the boxing ring. He starts, like, you know, throwing punches at his bridge crew, and he makes a mistake of doing that to Tuvok, the Vulcan on the bridge, he easily defeats him. It's like a, it's like a child and an adult. It takes about a second to happen. Uh, but we learned that in Deep Space Nine, that Vulcans are three times, at least three times stronger than human beings. Uh, but in, in these earlier days, that wasn't known. And Chandra Masher and Mina Kalbreth clearly think that Vulcans are like ten times stronger than humans. That, that, that James, when he goes to the Romulan Star Empire, will he even be able to open a door? <laughs> Is he that physically weak? Uh, I've said before, that doesn't really jive with the Enterprise incident itself. In the episode of, called The Enterprise Incident, Kirk is confronted by a Romulan who is standing six feet away from him, fully ready for to fight him. And Kirk easily beats him. So, oh, the strength differential was there. But uh, the price of the Phoenix, I don't I don't know how bad I have to worry about spoiling these, these things to you. The price of the Phoenix has a rousing ending. And it, the part of the ending is that we don't know if Rom, if Omni is alive or dead. He seems mortally wounded, but did he set up his device to work on himself? Did he do it? And The Price of the Phoenix was really popular with Star Trek readers at the time, myself included. So our writers wrote a sequel, The Fate of the Phoenix. That's the original cover with no Enterprise, no Kirk, no Spock, just a, an original cover that's designed for fans of the book. Fans of the book will know that that is James and the Romulan Commander. Uh, and it's much longer than The Price of the Phoenix, and it takes its starting point with Omni coming alive. Uh, it took the biggest gamble of all. Will my machines actually work a second time? Will they work from such a distance? And they do. He, he wakes up in a freshly minted, perfect, new, replicated body, bent on revenge. Now, the first time that he learns that his devices work is when he is wrecked in mortal combat with Mr. Spock. They fight. They do hand-to-hand -hand combat in uh, the, one of the climaxes of The Price of the Phoenix. And in order not to have his memories violated by Mr. Spock tele telepathically, Omni kills himself, puts a gun to his chin and pulls the trigger while Spock is mind-melding with him. So, again, again, the science is a little bit wonky here, but according to the recording mechanism of the Phoenix process, that means that 
Omni now has Spock's engrams. He is Spock's the thing that he needs to put in a Spock duplicate. He now has, and of course he has Spock's transporter scan from when Spock and Kirk transport down to his planet in the Price of the Phoenix. So technically he could make a copy of Spock, much the way he did with Jim Kirk. And that's what happens in the Fate of the Phoenix. We get a copy of Spock, we get a copy of Omni. We also have the copy of Jim Kirk as James, who is now looks like a Romulan. We have the Romulan commander back again. And we have Kirk and Spock. And Kirk and Spock, it's the Kirk and Spock of the Star Trek fan fiction world. They don't act much like you would think of them. Spock is a primordial character here. He has been so rocked by the emotional events of The Price of the Phoenix that he has lost all but a fraction of his Vulcan's emotional self-control. So he's much more like a primordial Vulcan. And Kirk is very much like a damsel in distress. He has a, re a redeeming moment at the end of The Price of the Phoenix, but the people who wrote that old dot zine Star Trek fan fiction very much liked a victimized Kirk. Not as, quite as much as they liked a victimized Spock, but still, they liked th these two to be victims. Victims of torture, victims of oppression, victims of uh, sexual abuse. Uh, they liked that. That was, I don't know why, but that was an active part of that kind of fiction. And it's very active in this book, too. Omni still wants to dominate Kirk, but halfway through the book, the Omni has an accident, and it, it uh, splits his memory. It makes him partially amnesiatic. So it's not that he doesn't remember who he is, it's that he thinks he is an earlier version of himself, Omnidon, before the massively disillusioning events of his life that turned him into Omni and turned him against the Federation. Uh, so we, it's, a, it's a much bigger, more complex storyline. It's much more sprawling. There's a lot more. There's almost no spacefaring in, in The Price of the Phoenix. There's more of that here, more starship action, more exotic planets and whatnot. Uh, and I made an arrangement with Randy Ray, the literate Texan, to read all of the Sondra Marshak and Myrna Colbert Star Trek novels. Uh, he, and he did, he indulged me, and we, he read The Price of the Phoenix, knowing perfectly well that it was my favorite Star Trek novel. And there were parts of it, it was a reread for him, I think. I think a lot of old-time Star Trek fans read it a long time ago. But uh, he read it indulgently. And was a, it was, he did a really good review on it. and was willing to point out its strengths and weaknesses, and willing to point out that it had strengths. And then he turned himself loose on the fate of the Phoenix, knowing perfectly well that I love the book. And you know what the old Sidewinder did? He ripped it to shreds. That's what he did. <laughs> he ripped it to shreds. I was watching his great review video of this book with tears streaming silently down my face. He mentions, for instance, uh, that there's a, a sexual element between Kirk and Spock in this book. And I want to read you a passage, uh, because I don't see where he's getting that. That's just his imagination. I will do the one thing I cannot do, the Vulcan's mind voice said in Kirk's mind, and Kirk caught some hint of the cost of that kind of link to the Vulcan. And in the same moment, Kirk felt the full mental contact, but it was flame. Kirk screamed somewhere in his mind, he thought, but could not be sure. Something was wrong with the Vulcan, and something was wrong with him, and the meeting of their minds was one sheet of blind, incandescent flame, which sent searing tendrils down into Kirk's mind, burning out God knew what. He writhed in agony and called Spock, but the Vulcan seemed caught in it too. Spock must be hurt, psionically. He had used the deep link today for a purpose it was not to serve, and Omni had torn out Spock's link with James by its roots. If this flame was the result of psionic shock, but Kirk could not maintain coherent thought, the agony was beyond anything he had known. First time always is. Uh, from somewhere it was as if he could feel his mind putting up defenses beyond his will for his life, shutting off, shutting out, closing down. Perhaps it was the Vulcan's life, too. Then, last line of defense. Or perhaps that flame in the other mind was another kind of psychic shock from the mingling of Omni and Spock. No, that thought led to utter chaos. Kirk felt the walls closing down, locking him away from the Vulcan, if it was the Vulcan, locking down tight, clanging like emergency doors closing. No, not alone. I don't see anything sexual in that. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what Randy's talking about. Uh, 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 but Randy also mentions in his review that the, the Phoenix is full of overdone purple prose. 
Again, I don't know where he's getting this. I mean, let me give you just one example here of the taut, steely control here. Uh, then she saw James realize that the last terrible Vulcan control could crack entirely. With that year's deep knowledge of the Vulcan, which was still his, James drew the hand back with an effort which looked as if it broke something, perhaps his heart. But he was steady, as if to steady the Vulcan with his eyes. The moment when only their eyes met was the seal on everything that had been with the ending of it. All right. <laughs> All right. Maybe. Possibly. There is some overwriting in this book. Maybe. Maybe possibly. There is. I still don't think that Randy should have acted like a Denebian slime devil and stomped all over it. Has he no care for my feelings? What about the time back in San Antonio when he and I underwent the deep locating link? <laughs> or was it just the tequila? I don't know. <laughs> Either way, for, for Book Trek 2023, I had the dubious pleasure of a diehard longtime reader, a longtime Star Trek fan, a longtime science fiction reader, a former bookstore owner, rake the fate of the Phoenix over the coals. <laughs> and it's not even Garbogast. <laughs> so, so that's my Book Trek book for today, unfortunately. Now he's moving on. He's moving on. Sandra Marshak and Neil Caldreth wrote two other books. One called the Prometheus Design, and one called Triangle, and he's moving on to two to those two. So I will I will move on to those as well. They are two of the only Star Trek books that I have in actual print and paste and paper form, but I also have them as eBooks. And I'm just hope that he's a little gentler with them than he was with Fate of the Phoenix. And Fate of the Phoenix ends on a note that clearly makes it clear that these two were at least contemplating a third book. I wish that a third book had happened. I wish that we got the end to the story. And we don't. We don't ever get the end to the story. Uh, but it couldn't be written now. <laughs> a chance in hell. Paramount would be all over this thing like butter on toast. They wouldn't get off the launch pad. I'm still glad that we have it. And I will reread The Fate of the Phoenix for the rest of my born days. <laughs> Randy Ray or no Randy Ray. <laughs> but anyway, I'll wrap this up for now, but I'll be back. <laughs> Thank you, Book Two.